The gathering is a quarterly meeting of our faculty, our students and staff, uh, for them to come together to get to know each other. We have a little social time, we uh, learn about the programs and some, there's an orientation, but then we also hear from a, a visionary speaker uh, who comes in every time. And tonight's guest is Dr. Atul Shah. He's a uh, fascinating individual from London who puts his own personal values to work in the business place. And so he's an advocate for the triple bottom line uh, where he puts people first and the world first. And so we're excited about what he'll bring to us uh, this evening. Jainism is one of the oldest living cultures of the world, uh, founded on the principle of ahimsa or respect for all life. What I see in the world is a serious problem with leadership, you know. Uh, I, I, I'm based in Britain, but uh, you see that uh, a lot of leaders, leaders have a lot of power, but they don't have the values uh, to match that, nor do they have a kind of philosophical base uh, to have a good framework for their thinking and their action. And here I am, uh, having inherited a framework which actually is extremely timely for the 21st century. Uh, so many things are coming together to say that these are the kinds of elements which we need for the future. For example, concern with the environment, concern with animal welfare, uh, the, the, ex, the increase in greed, um, the need for interdisciplinary thinking, understanding, the need for tolerance, forgiveness, all those elements have been in our tradition for thousands of years and I, I inherited it for free and I feel it's my duty, not my choice, to share. And Claremont has been brilliant at giving us that platform to share that wisdom. Uh, and it's been a wonderful uh, few days here. Thanks to everyone. Yeah. Our aim is to transform uh, leadership, especially, and, and, cultural in, and, and bring cultural intelligence into organizations and help transform organizational cultures. This gathering is for people to come together face to face to get to know each other, to uh, interact with each other, to socialize, but also to uh, learn from each other. And so it's a, um, an opportunity for the online students to come in face to face and meet each other. That's what we're doing tonight. I really was drawn into what it means to have real social impact and to actually be someone who can do that in the future as well. Um, I think it really attracted me to that program. This is an innovative program. This is a program that will provide me with, um, with some dialogue, um, participation, and a much larger uh, understanding uh, than my current environment. To come here from Pittsburgh, to see it, to feel the energy, to meet the professors, and really, really just get involved in it, uh, there is no place like it. I knew immediately that I was in the right place, doing what I needed to do, and I look forward to doing well. I am so excited to, to learn um, about the people, uh, where we all come from. We come from different places around the country. We have different life experiences. We are different ages. Uh, we come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different faith backgrounds. And that's very exciting. That is an enriching uh, environment in which to learn. And so I'm very thankful for that uh, component to this program. It is an exciting time because I'm going to be able to let go of, of GRID, I think, is what I've been doing for a couple of years and really focus on what I ultimately want to do is like social impact and, and, and within my nonprofit. So I, I'm really excited that this is happening. So. The giving of knowledge, the sharing of knowledge is an honor for any soul. Uh, and uh, you know, I have met some of the students already before and I see the thirst and the curiosity. Some have traveled far to be here. Uh, and uh, this is a subject which is very close to my heart and I have lots of experiences and stories which I can share uh, and which are quite diverse as well because of my kind of history and background so I'm really re excited. Welcome to the gathering. Uh, my name is John Hooten, if we haven't uh, met each other yet. I'm Vice President for Educational Innovation uh, here at Claremont Lincoln and it is my immense pleasure to welcome you all here. I mentioned outside that we have more people here than we expected, and that is wonderful. And by the time classes begin a week from now, uh, we'll have about, we expect about three times as many students uh, enrolled in the classes as we have here. Mostly because they're coming from 
a lot of different kinds of places. <laughs> lots to do tonight, lots to talk about tonight. Um, but first, I want to introduce the second president of Claremont Lincoln University, Eileen Aranda, to give us a few words of welcome. And uh, Eileen accepted the position this summer. Yeah. So just shortly, our, our new president. And so we're happy to have her here and to, uh, to offer her the opportunity to, to welcome you all. So Eileen. Welcome. This is such a wonderful sight. And thank you all for being pioneers with us. Um, we believe we have a program that is so exciting. You have that core that helps you reach out, bridge the gaps, go beyond your particular discipline. Mindfulness, that ability to look inside yourself, understand the values that you have. One of the speakers yesterday at the conference said, it is so important to understand how you're going to do things, to understand your value system and what drives you, what is your passion. Dialogue, the ability to, for heaven's sakes, ask questions. Draw out, understand what other people need, want, believe. Collaboration, we can't do it alone. Everybody needs to work together, but that's a skill set. You can't just bring people into a room and say, okay, let's all work together. All of you already know that is not a prescription for success. There are skills associated with that, and that's what collaboration teaches you, and those combined to change making. Claremont Lincoln's mission is to make the world a better place. And those are the skills, along with your specialties, that need to be honed in order for you to be able to do that. So welcome tonight. You are in for a treat. Um, and thanks for coming. Tonight's speaker for the gathering is Dr. Atul Shah, who has flown all the way here from London and I'm sure is as exhausted as I am after the extravaganza of conference talks that we've experienced the last few days. Um, I won't go too deeply into his biography because I'll let him tell his own story, but he is a London-based financier, he is a trained accountant, he is a professor, uh, he was educated at the London School of Economics, and he is the CEO and president of Diverse Ethics, a company out of London that consults with uh, other corporations on how they can improvise, uh, innovate, come up with ways to make their organizations more ethical. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Atul K. Shah. Thanks, Whitney. So for those of you who are not familiar with the gathering, it is a series of five questions not terribly dissimilar from inside, like, inside the actor's studio with James Lipton which I was watching earlier this week, and he has blue cards, so I asked for green. So, uh, so oh, green is the only color. Green is the only color there is, so. <laughs> so, Atul, first question. What do you do, and why does it matter? Oh, uh, at first, first and foremost, I am an educator. Um, I love teaching. I love sharing wisdom. And the slogan here, it's uh, at Claremont. Uh, wisdom at work. Uh, I think there is a lot of scope for wisdom at work. Teaching uh, in the Indian tradition is defined as an act of not of giving knowledge to the student, but sparking the light within the student so that they get inspired and motivated to learn. So that whole philosophy of teaching and learning is a kind of partnership, but also there is this fundamental belief that each and every soul has the potential to achieve great things, and the role of the educator is to spark that light, to enable them to see their own strength, uh, their own values, and then to be able to feel confident that they can go further beyond that. Question number two. 
What is sacred to you? All living, all life is sacred. Just as I would not like to suffer any harm or pain, uh, all living beings uh, feel that way and we need to respect that. I was brought up in that tradition from childhood and you know when you're a child of parents and if they say this is how we live, this is what we eat, this is what we do, you kind of don't question. You just think every parent is like that. Every culture in the world is like that. There's no different. But of course, uh, you know, as you grow up and as you go outside your community and meet different people, you realize that different cultures look at life differently. But I consider myself hugely fortunate to have inherited this what I consider to be a kind of 21st century philosophy, free of charge <laughs> and fortunately for me, and this connects with what we're talking about in terms of leadership, my father was a major community le leader in Mombasa in Kenya. So my role model for my leadership was my own father. And I was at an event in England recently where people were asked, you know, who are your role models? And everyone named role models from kind of film or Martin Luther King, people whom they have ne they'd never met. And I said, my father is my role model. And they found it quite surprising. But for me, it was very natural. And I would encourage all of these aspiring ethical leaders to try and find these kinds of role models close to them whose example and whose actions motivate them to do more, to learn from them. Role models are never perfect. So don't expect them to be perfect. But the very fact that they are, through their lifestyle, through their actions, trying to live a philosophy, giving life to a philosophy, it's not from a textbook, but they're actually trying. They're they are doing compromises. They are building bridges. Uh, they are trying to do something which is beyond their self, you know, and that's very special. Now, number three, what's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I had uh, qualified as a CPA equivalent here over there we call it chartered accountant and you know because my father had these amazing contacts and speakers used to come to over town all the time to address the community uh, this very eminent uh, speaker from India uh, Mr. Shashikant Mehta who was an industrialist as well as a philosopher uh, was in my house and he said to me so now now that you are qualified and you're a professional person, what are you going to do? You're going to build a big house, drive a better car, go on good holidays. Is that all? Is that all you're going to do with your life? Or are you going to use your knowledge and your skills to help others, to lift society, to take it in new directions, in new more ethical directions? And just that one question, I mean, you know, was was completely transformative because initially I couldn't really answer it. But then as I reflected on it, I realized that actually anyone can do that, you know, if they put their mind to it. But uh, the world needs people who are different, people who look beyond themselves, and uh, people who actually find joy in the service of others. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, number four. When did an ethical decision cost you the most? Uh, well, uh, today in the conference this morning, I spoke about giving up my academic career to launch this global magazine on the Jain culture. Uh, um, in order, I felt that this culture needed disseminating, it needed sharing, and it needed a kind of contemporary language which is accessible to people all over the world. 
and it needs to go into libraries, into schools, etc. And there was a group of people who said, I am the best person for it. So it wasn't just me. There was a board of uh, directors, and we created this um, non-profit organization. And, uh, you know, it was uh, a very risky decision. I had a 10-year academic position. I gave all that up because I thought this is a challenge. And yes, uh, one of the board members, our chairman, said, you know, without risk, there is no life. You know? So in life, you have to take risks. So I took the risk. But unfortunately, after about seven years, we ran out of funding for this magazine. And it was difficult after that for a while you know, to kind of get my feet up. And also, it kind of knocks your self-confidence and self-esteem. Looking back, uh, I wonder why I even kind of regretted anything. Because what I did was I took the community to a place where it didn't even know it could go. You know? And I shared the culture with people who had never even heard about it. And I, I acted as a catalyst in uh, a global transformation project. So, so I think that's the other thing about ethical leadership. Don't be afraid to make uh, mistakes. Actually, mistake is not really a good word. But to take risks, I think, is a better word. Don't be afraid to take risks. Be prepared that they may not work out in the first instance at all times. But recognize that the reason you are different is because you have chosen to take that risk. You have not run away from that decision. You have not become scared by the desire to transform people around you. And if you look at the great leaders in our history, they've taken massive risks with their life. So. This word mistake, it really comes from a kind of age where academics are regarded as the be all and end all of life, and where, you know, all the time you have to prove yourself to an exam board or, or to uh, a, a teacher. But realistically speaking, if you can find success within yourself, uh, if you can develop your own self-confidence, then you will want to make mistakes, because you see them as opportunities for growth and for learning. And, uh, and as, as, as people say, experience is the greatest teacher. Given all of your talents, if you could, what would you change in the world? If you could just make it happen. Money is a human creation. It does not actually have fundamental meaning. If we can understand the limits of money, if we can see value in things which are beyond money, if we can see ways in which we can use other methods to build community and to build peace in our neighborhoods, then that would be the, the greatest achievement for humanity. Because we have completely lost an understanding and a, uh, a relationship with money. And we do not understand its limits. <laughs>